uh, as a philosopher, um, I meant I was interested in the uh, the philosophical ideas behind Jung's collective works, and I I wrote a paper called Jung's Metaphysics, and after that I had decided to write a few more papers. I went to my first Jungian uh, conference in Cape Town, uh, South Africa in 2017. And that's where I had the good fortune to meet um, a lot of lovely people from the Jungian community and particularly from the International Association for Jungian Studies, which hosted the conference. And I immediately fell in love with uh, with the people, uh, I have, I've, I've been in different circles, um, classically trained Freudian uh, scholar, um, Lacanian, and as well as a contemporary critic of intersubjectivity and relational psychoanalysis. So coming around to Jung was uh, rounding out my um, self-education but um, it's it's led to it's led to me into different directions, and so um, when I met Eric Goodwin, um, we immediately started to have a simpatico about our thinking and, and an interest in the archetypes. And and Eric, of course, is a pioneer in this uh, before myself. So ha having. Um, engaged in a series of uh, dialogues about what, what is, um, you know, what is the foundation of Jungian thinking led us to this book that we called Ar Archetypal Ontology. So it, hopefully this is not going to um, be too heavy, but I, I hope uh, to make it at least my talk digestible and would then you know, value some kind of uh, discussion with the audience afterwards. So let, let, me, uh, let me begin. Arguably the most definitive feature of Jung's metapsychology is his theory of archetypes. It is the fulcrum on which his analytical depth psychology rests. To this day, there is no unified consensus on, one, on what constitutes an archetype. Even Young himself was murky at best. It's, isn't that unbelievable though? The, the very foundation of Jungian thought, we cannot agree upon what it is. Um, Jungians are divided and propose contradictory, if not sometimes unintelligible theories about the ground, breadth, and limits to archetypal discourse, ranging from uncritical acceptance of classical paradigms to dismissing the notion altogether. Jung's notion of the archetype remains an equivocal concept, so much so that Jungians and post-Jungians have failed to agree on its essential nature. I wish to argue that an archetype may be understood as an unconscious schemata that is self-constitutive and emerges into consciousness from its own a priori ground. Hence, an autonomous self-determinant act derived from archaic ontology. I'd like to briefly set out here today to philosophically investigate the essence of an archetype by examining its origins and dialectical reflections as a process system arising from its own autochthonous parameters. As an overview, I will offer a descriptive explication of the inner constitution and birth of an archetype based on internal rupture and the desire to project its universality, form, and patternings into psychic reality as self-instantiating replicators. Archetypal content is the appearance of essence as the products of self-manifestation. For an archetype must appear in order to be made actual. Here we must seriously question that 
in the beginning, if an archetype is self-constituted and self-generative, the notion and validity of a collective unconscious becomes rather dubious, if not superfluous. The infrastructure of the brain is not the same as the psyche, which is a higher order agency, a complex, self-determinate process system arising from its original dialectical unconscious organization. Although our embodiment is necessary and makes the experiential apparatus and internalization process possible, it is not sufficient condition to explain psyche. Neither is our environmental facticity. What is missing from the equation is that intermediate mediatory sphere of the capacity to spontaneously express and actualize freedom in all its glory and shortcomings. This is where the language of archetypes intervenes nicely as a potential explicans. In other words, an archetype is self-constituted and self-generative within the context and confines of its immediate ontological throneness. For Jung, the nature of reality is psychic process constituted as an impersonal anima animating force that is superimposed on human experience and transgenerationally transmitted throughout the ages. This is the doctrine of archetypes. Although Jung was very inconsistent in his thinking on the nature of the archetypes, which went through many theoretical revisions through his lifetime, including viewing them as instincts, images, forms, affect and fantasy, patterns of behavior, and a numinous mystical category, and even as immaterial entities. He was not very impressed with having to think the same thing all the time. This is one reason why there continues to be confusion, contradiction, and lack of consensus in the archetype debate that is still very much alive in esoteric scholarly circles. Increasingly throughout his career, Jung began to refer to archetypes as autonomous, as autocratic, and manifesting themselves involuntarily to consciousness. Hence having a degree and level of independence emanating from the unconscious, which are quote, experienced as spontaneous entities, end quote. And that quote arise from self-creative acts. Following Jung, who attributes subjectivity to archetypes, if we come to view the archetype as a psychic arranger, much like a soul animator that coordinates, controls, and directs the internal relations, forms, contents, and modes of unconscious process, then we may not inappropriately refer to this mediatory organizer as an unconscious nucleus or impersonal micro-agency spewing forth self-states into consciousness as the dispersal of its internal essence with quasi-autonomous properties bubbling up from within the deep abyss. What develops is a sense of agency or selfhood that makes further self-experience and self-learning possible. The content of, of such self-dispersal we have come to label and identify as manifestations of the archetypal. While the, I would argue the archetype as such is occluded, we experience and know its presence as appearances within consciousness. In a previous book of mine, or it's called Origins on the Genesis of Psychic Reality, I offer a formal psychoanalytic metaphysics articulating the birth of psychic agency. Unconscious mind is a series of spacings 
that first instantiate themselves as a multitude of schemata, which are the building blocks of psychic reality. A schema is a desirous, apperceptive, ideational unit of self-experience that is teleologically oriented and dialectically constituted. Schemas may be viewed as micro-agents with semi-autonomous powers of telic expression that operate as self-states as they create spacings within the unconscious mind. Schemata may take various forms from the archaic to the refined and materialize as somatic, sensuous, affective, perceptual, and conceptual, hence symbolic, orders within the psyche, each having their own intrinsic pressures, valences, intensities, intentional and defensive strategies, and unconscious qualia. The microdynamics of schematic expression can be highly individualistic in their bid for freedom, creativity, complex complexity, and agenic intent, and are tantamount to the instinctual, desirous, and, and defensive processes we are accustomed to attribute to unconscious mentation in general. The difference here is that schemata are inherently both free and determined, or perhaps more appropriately, freely determined. That is, they are self-constituted and determine it within the natural parameters in which they find themselves and operate. This means that schematic expression is highly contextual and contingent. Yet schemata exist in a multiplicity of process systems that commune, interact, and participate in a society of events that mutually influence the unique constitution of each schematic structure within the sea of the mind. This overdetermination of psychic processes ensures that unconscious agency ultimately underlies the constitution of all mental functioning. I wish to apply this conceptual scheme to the nature of an archetype. In my language, an archetype would be tantamount to unconscious schemata. There are two general theoretical frameworks we can adopt. One is that we merely assume archetypes are forms and fantasies with uh, desirous affective um, image properties or imaginal properties that are generated by the mind derived from unconscious genesis. This view could conceivably be compatible with both Freudian and Jungian conceptions of the unconscious. The second option is that we adopt another speculative framework that attributes the powers of self-generation to the archetype itself. If an archetype is autonomous, according to Jung, and self-constituted, are we not justified in attributing a modicum of agency to its inner constitution? While I would not want to attribute selfhood to the constitution of an archetype, as if it were a self, a subject or personality in its own right, strictly speaking, this would not rule out the possibility of agency with the capacity for determinate expression. In fact, there is a a certain degree of teleology inherent to an archetype because it's oriented to express itself, to reveal itself in consciousness, to disclose itself from concealment in its quest to become manifest. Although an archetype is not a proper agent, it nevertheless exudes and executes agency by the mere fact that it appears in the psyche and in all societies. An archetype is therefore a paradigm paradigmatic prototype 
or exemplary model oriented to repeat itself as archaic form in psychic productions. There is a certain independence in an archetype's capacity towards self-assertion to impose its presence on psychic reality. In other words, if archetypes are self-states or quasi-micro-agents that cluster into their own autonomous organizations in the mind, they have their own internal relations and telic modes of expression. By applying the notion of unconscious schemata as a telic experiential process or self-manifestation, we may potentially explain how archetypes manifest from their primordial ontology. Let, let us first start with origins from pre-beginning, the unconscious cosmogenic act of creation. Because archetypes cannot just appear or blink into existence ex nihilo, they must emerge from a primal dynamic ground of self-experience. At the very least, we can say is that archetypes must derive from an unconscious organizing principle that is inter internally impelled to materialize, that is to become, and is hence subject to being apprehended in consciousness, or otherwise archetypes would never appear. Because of the innate autonomy to manifest, this means that an archetype by necessity would have an agentic character with a particular telos, which accounts for its multiplicity of forms or patterns, as well as its specific contents, themes, qualities, valences, intensities, and so forth. We may further speculate that because of the autonomous character, it is self-derived and self-activating, for without which it would not be released from its unconscious slumber or primal hiddenness. In other words, without such an agentic disposition or proclivity to project or externalize itself into psychic reality, it would not appear. The point here is that in order for an archetype to properly exist, it must make itself actual through determinative action as the coming into being of internal presence. An archetype is construed to be an internal presence, first and foremost, as a summoning of the interior but we do not know exactly why it re radiates, radiates its essence. If there is a prior subordinate force, field or system directing the process and or what its essence really signifies, only that its source is from within. That's an epistemological position of how we come to know internal experience. It's from within. Those claiming, as Jung did, that archetypes are transpersonal, cosmic uh, external occurrences or organizations superimposed on our interior have a messy epistemological burden to reckon with. Taking on a collective unconscious agent creator or transsubjective entity only anthropomorphizes the construct and further problematizes the question of origins by conjuring up a supernatural mac macro anthropos. It may prove more useful to stay focused on how emergence may transpire from internality, as this is all we can directly know epistemically as phenomenal near inner experience. Here we only need to adopt the theoretic standpoint of internally derived activity to show its logical coherence. For appearance descends and springs from its prior dialectical movements. 
before appearance, before archetypal manifestation, we must posit primordial ground as the a priori condition for the unfolding of unconscious phenomenology, or what I call ontophenomenology as inner ontology. Rather than solicit a collective supernatural process where archetypes are said to stem, we may more modestly begin with a naturalized account of psychic phenomenon derived from unconscious organizing principles governing internal psychological dynamics. Rather than import the philosophical implications of emanationism or supervenience, what is more plausible to me is that internal phenomenon condition our metaphysical postulates. And I believe this would be very commensurate with what Jung would say. While Jung would most uh, probably agree with this, his incongruencies on the nature of the collective unconscious cloud a proper appreciation of the exact nature and essence of what constitutes an archetype. Proceeding from the proposition that archetypes are in essence internal presences, this is much less problematic than asserting their mind independent existence coming from a psychic or a cosmic psyche that uh, Dr. Goodman's going to talk about under the rubric of metaphysical realism. If we succeed in attributing a modicum of agency to the inner constitution of an archetype, then an archetype must have a motive, a telos as aim, to reveal itself, to express or externalize itself, to make its presence felt and known. In this regard, it is no different than an unconscious desire to fulfill a wish. And it does so by objectifying itself, that is by making itself an object for consciousness. Archetypes arise in psyche for us, but how do they arise? In other words, what is the mechanism or process that precedes their appearance in consciousness? If archetypes are self-activating, then they must emerge from their own ground. In the beginning, I suggest, an archetype is a, a self-enclosed unity that must undergo internal division via splitting by its own hands in order to externalize itself from its unconscious void of indeterminateness. This would require an initial act of self-posit or self-assertion where it would rouse or stir itself from indeterminateness to determinate being, that is from unconscious parallax to conscious presence, from inarticulate implicitness to articulated explicitness in the psyche. In its initial awakening as self-arousal, an archetype must first take itself as its own content which is at first its own simple unity, its original form. In taking its original form as its initial content, it performs its own self-mediation as a dialectical enactment of instituting differentiation into its form, which becomes the initial movement from a self-enclosed universality to a differentiated identity as the dispersal of particularity, the instantiation of its essence into psychic reality. This initial act of differentiation and modification becomes the logical model for further patterns and dialectical relations to transpire as archetypes are released and begin to populate mental life. 
archetypes first must manifest as internal presence before they make their transition or trajectory to external presence, namely as concrete universals that take many forms, such as collective or anthropological motifs, myths, material productions, art and aesthetic expressions, social institutions, cultural organizations, civilizations, ideals, religious beliefs, customs, rituals, and so on. These examples are the derivatives of archetypes. Archetypes first manifest as unconscious subjectivity, only to become more rich and robust in content schemata and patternings when breaching into consciousness and objectified in individual personality and the semiotic socio-symbolic structures that define and govern any culture. If an archetype is at its most basic configuration, a patterning of a universal process, then such patterning cannot contain an empty formalism without jeopardizing the integrity of the theory. Rather, I argue that patterning of an archetype arises from its own internal divisions and splitting maneuvers that naturally introduce mediation between oppositions. Such mediations are two-way internal relations that properly belong to the dialectical form of an archetype that bears a basic structural content as the bifunctionality of identity and difference. When an archetype arouses itself through rupture from its self-enclosed slumber to the self-certainty of its own pre-reflective being from implicitness to explicitness, it apprehends itself as unconscious apperception the coming to presence of its inchoate simple form. In this initial act of apperception, an archetype performs a pre-subjective determination of instituting differentiation from its previous unmodified shape via reflection into itself, which raises itself to a determinate being for self as mediated self-certainty. Here the apperceptive act of arousal simultaneously is the conferral of its own discrete identity that it sets over itself in relation to all particularities of difference. Opposition becomes the internal dynamic in which dialectical mediation takes place, which is ontically conjoined as an inter interplay between identity and difference. As an archetype intuits itself as an apperceptive being, it gives itself identity that stands in relation to otherness, anotherness that is necessary in order to concretize the act of self-definition as the awakening of its essence as an internal impetus to manifest. Here we may say that an archetype originally becomes aware of itself as a pre-reflective burgeoning subjectivity, what we may call an unconscious self-consciousness, the simple self-apperceptive immediacy of its being. Now, why does an architect, the archetype have such an internal impetus to manifest? Because it lacks because it desires. Here the desire to wake, to apprehend itself, to manifest, is the expression of its own felt being in relation to lack. This is the prototype of the human psyche. Desire as being in relation to lack is the initial essential configuration of an archetype. For it wants to be to experience, to become other than its mere self-enclosed unity. This breach 
into experience as desire to rectify its lack of being is the first expressive act of self-posit, which elevates the archetype to a living process. It feels compelled to externalize as the coming into being of its own actual existence. Here, archetypal process is summarized as the need to experience as being toward life. Just as an archetype stirs the psyche through emotional seizure, it first experiences its own internal stirring as self-seizure to awaken and externalize its essence as a living process through self-rupture. We may further suggest that this initial act of self-posit is imbued with existential value and, and carries an emotional tone as it apprehends itself in its awakened self-immediacy. The organic sequence of such self-instantiation may further be viewed through the lens of a developmental monistic ontology. Moving from the upheaval of its own disquieted desire to self-apprehension constitutes the birth of the psyche and consequently the archetype for which our own consciousness may in turn apprehend as a psychic entity or presence populating mental life. Just as an archetype is seized to self-awaken, so too is the human mind jarred to feel its internal presence. Of course, we could be speaking uh, generically about raw affect or emotions in general, but the phenomenal experience is qualitatively different. Archetypes feel like they are connected to something outside of or independent from the self, despite the fact that they arise from and are encountered within. In this way, we may further say that an archetype is the epitome of otherness for its experiential announcement and imposition on consciousness is registered as an unfettered event. The epistemology of this seemingly autonomous process is what adds a further layer of uncanniness and numinosity to the experience, if not uh, alienation from its origins, even if we are mistaken or deluded in interpreting the agency of their internal recurrence. When the psyche comes to notice the myriad patterns in which archetypes manifest, a recurrent theme of repetition cannot escape the discerning self-reflective cogito. Although archetypes are everywhere in psyche and culture, we must not lose sight of their fundamental significance. They are replications of original form. We may further say they are self-generating replicators or we would not encounter their ubiquity without the antediluvian drive of spontaneous repetition. Civilization is compelled to re reproduce them in our psychosocial arrangements that govern human exchange based on the simple fact that we remember and rewrite history in our preoccupation with the past. This sociological observance highlights the primacy of looking back at, revisiting, acknowledging, and even savoring history as an idealized need for nostalgia, not as immediate presence, but as recapitulation or eternal recurrence. This is why the imaginary has such a stronghold over consciousness for archetypes repeat themselves through images and associative fantasies that are more or less timeless. The notion or fantasy of eternal recurrence is the psycho mythology 
the mind generates and gravitates toward in order to confer meaning and ground its being. In this way, archetypes are the foundation and fulfillment of archaic ontology. Every reproduction, every repetition stands in illo tempore as attempts at duplication and regeneration. Does an archetype perform a cognitive act? No, unless you consider it a psychological entity in its own right. Is it registered, felt, and perceived by the psyche? Yes. But is there really any difference between the two? In other words, is an archetype independent of mind and culture? Well, not likely. But does it appear as if it is an unconscious force in the psyche? Epistemologically, categorically, hence logically, and phenomenologically, yes. But can we ever really know its metaphysical status? To make an archetype super sensible, as Jung does by evoking Plato's eternal forms, is misguided, I argue, because this gives them a supernatural significance we are in no way capable of verifying. All we can know is naturalized experience, the coming into being of inner presence. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, are there any questions um, based on uh, John's uh, talk so far? Please raise your hand using Zoom or Eric, you can go ahead. <laughs> well, <clears throat> I wanted to, um, that, of course, thank you for that uh, great presentation. Um, but I wanted to see if you would, for myself and for anyone else interested in um, the way that you describe the way, the, how an archetype emerges from the unconscious ground if you had any examples to to give us and then showing us like at the different points because you you identify different several different points of the splitting and then the existence in relation to lack and all and i love the way you do that um i was wondering if you could give us an example and show us like where these points happen to the degree that you can because if you and if nothing comes to mind i've got one <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, I'm trying to think of something that's not personal, um, but perhaps that's different, um, difficult to do. Uh, how do I separate my sense of self and personhood from something that might be collective and impersonal? Um, well, I'll go back to my experience in um, this plane where I about, we took a, we took a dive uh, in the sky and I mean, it was quite abrupt and, you know, people started screaming, we're, we're, we're dropping and, you know, the internal panic set in and all of a sudden the images of my family, my, my wife and children just popped right into my mind and their, their presence, their faces in the order of their birth. And it just immediately brought a calm over me. And one can say that's a personal and conscious, but at the same time, I would say that that would be archetypal as well, because it, it's, it represents love and your family. Um, but that, it, I know that doesn't have the same significance as more cultural myths and, and um, other motifs that, I, that, that you've done a tremendous amount of work on, Eric. So... Please tell us your example. <laughs> well, I was what I was thinking of was a, a dream that was presented to me by a, a military vet. And uh, <clears throat> he was having a lot of PTSD symptoms. He was about to separate from his active duty service. And he had a dream where he was engaged in intense urban combat in the States, which was something he never did. In reality, not in the States. He did do urban combat overseas. And halfway through this dream, he, he needed to attend a ceremony 
And so he went to his barracks uh, and everyone that was there in his whole life that he knew was there and they were hung over half asleep and they didn't like him. And he said, I've got to attend the ceremony. Where is my uniform? And they all point to the wall and he sees his uniform and it's covered in blood and dirt and he's devastated and <clears throat> he runs away. He goes back into the urban combat and um, he's given an assignment and he has to find this bomb in the city. He finds the bomb, but he can't figure out how to disarm it and it blows up. Okay. So now my analysis of this dream when I was working with him was that it was about the return of the warrior back to civilization. And the ceremony was the element that really, I think, tipped it off for me. Number one, it ends in tragedy, which means there's a process that's not occurring. But this, it seems to me, this would be a good example of your process where there's a non-ego entity within the psyche that says you need to get into the ceremony and you're running into these problems and part of it has to do with shame feeling rejected not integrated into society so for all that is imaged as the uniform <clears throat> but does that match your process or is there a way that you could explain how that imagery might em emerge in someone through those different processes that you describe or do you have completely different interpretation? <laughs> Let's, you know, we're looking at the micro dynamics of a, of a particular person's psyche. Uh, and it's, it's certainly hard when I'm talking at a really abstract level. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> but um, let me give it a shot. <laughs> Um, well, I, I, let me just throw out what I've seen uh, in your descriptive process. You describe in particular the relation to lack, which I think is very evident in archetypal images. And with him, there was a lack there of integration into society and away from combat that he hadn't really addressed or thought of. And yet the psyche knew. Right. And so this is the non like transpersonal, if you will, part of it, I would think. But, you know, maybe there's other pieces to this that you're seeing as well. Well, um, I don't profess to have the answer, um, but like, for instance, do, do we, when we experience things that, that, that seize us, where we have an emotional seizure of something, and it, it presents itself as foreign uh, or alien, um, but very much ha has its own organization and that's why i would call it some kind of agency or micro agency to itself it, yeah it um it awakens us in a different way and, and so um i was you trying to use a dialectic the dialectical logic of, of internal modification that builds kind of on itself and that becomes more rich and robust in its organizational form as it then comes into consciousness. So the question that you, I think, are raising for me is, is there an unconscious kind of uh, subjectivity that's, make, that's directing the process? Or is it, as you put it, a transpersonal mediatory factor that it's, out, it's coming from something else? And maybe that's the Jungian collective unconscious impersonal thing, or or is there any differentiation between, let's say, an unconscious ego uh, that's directing things? That that's the true soul, that's the you know, the inner psychic uh, authenticity that says you need to get to that you know aspect of your dream. Um, you're trying to compensate or, or trying to integrate or trying to reorganize these split off elements of, of, of psyche. And um, so this is what's hard for me to, of course, know, not working with your patient. Yeah, but, of course. But attempt, I'm attempting to try to understand. Um, so, so another point here is that how often do we like dreaming 
to use that example where it's like this does not feel like it's coming from me or my psyche it's being superimposed and i'm reacting to it so we're not aware of our inner self uh, or as a we're not aware of the self performing the the agentic function uh, of let's say uh, teleologically trying to solve something or integrate something or or make meaning of it but because we can't we can't self-reflectively be aware of our self-reflective function in the moment. It's only later that we can say, oh, that's probably what was happening here. Um, but what's fascinating to me, um, and I, have no, I do not have the answer here, um, is, is there really um, this locus of freedom in the psyche that generates all these things? Um, and is it the is it the spontaneous uh, spontaneity of, of psyche, or is this really my unconscious self that's operating? This is I don't have the I don't profess to have the, the answer to that, but it's fascinating all the same. It has to come from somewhere, and because I don't believe in um, hard determination, I don't believe that we are simply you know uh, causally determined um, we are determinative and we we work with like, within our embodiment and our psychic processes um, I would hate to think or I, I just have a hard time even imagining having a sense of choice and agency and freedom of will if we were to only view the psyche as some kind of you know, determined causal thing that's based on, you know, synapses in the brain that are trans, you know, firing in and off and et cetera. I'll stop there. Yeah, I, I agree with you there. But we'll get to neurons. <laughs> okay. Super. Um, John, you can unmute yourself and ask your question. John, you, you need to unmute yourself first. Sorry. There we go. You can hear me now? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, this is a, a two-part question, or just two questions, possibly. I'm wondering, in terms of um, developmental uh, perspective, if you thought about uh, Michael Fordham's ideas at all and um, the generation of the of the ego or the sense of small self and the need for integration and deintegration and the need for protection of that vulnerable developing self and how it can be overwhelmed by archetypal factors if it's not protected um so in general as well just a developmental idea um in the individual in relationship to the archetypes and then also um, the similarity between uh, dissociative identity disorder and multiple personality and how, as you describe what you're describing, it's so similar to the autonomy of uh, certain personalities and uh, et cetera. So those are my two questions. Okay. Well, thank you, John, for that. Um, I, I'll confess that I, I haven't read all the Jungian literature so I'm, my um, knowledge uh, of Fordham is limited at best. Um, but if we're going to apply uh, any kind of developmental um, perspective that would in some way resemble, let's say, object relations uh, theory or attachment uh, theory, um, the notion that the self develops from you know, more of a, uh, a simple or a more basic um, uh, organiz organization is something much more complex in its interactions with uh, its, ob its object world, whether it be, you know, the family, the community, the culture. Um, it would make sense, uh, we see as any of us who've had children, uh, or think of ourselves um, when we were children, that our sense of self uh, 
is is a developmental achievement. Um, uh, in many, I mean, who, whoever is, has a formulated self. I mean, myself now is is entirely different than when I was a younger man, let alone as a child. So, uh, but but we build on those experiences. Now, in my in my language or my, I guess, uh, philosophical writings, I, I gravitate toward uh, other um, lingo, but it might be the same that you're, you're describing. Do we, um, how do we protect ourselves? Um, how, how does our sense of self have segregated elements of experience that um, have their own internal defensive organizations? How do they come into contact with one another? By necessity, they would have to be able to communicate with one another, or they would have no shared essence to them. Um, so that would, by definition, for me, mean that things like, uh, you know, um, multiple selves don't really exist. They're more like self states. They're more like you know, dissociated states that could, in, you know, in principle be brought into uh, dialogue with one another, conversation, integration, um, uh, and, and that would then enrich a, uh, a more developmentally robust or sophisticated sense of self. Um, but we, we can't, uh, and this is, I think, a problem, is, and, I, and I, again, I can't resolve it. Do, do we really believe in the notion of a, um, how would I describe it? A pristine form of wholeness or holism when all we know is multiplicity of experiences. We can bring them into a kind of an abstract conceptual uh, unity um, but do we experience that do we really experience the sense of holism or is that a is that a transference to theory or a fantasy that drives our unconscious ideals um, at the same time the notion of transcendence the notion of you know the pursuit of wholeness is something that at least I can't deny in myself. And, and um, whatever we call it, metaphorically, we were wanting to get to some space of inner peace and contemplation and, and satisfaction or contentment. Um, so I'm, I'm meandering there, John, I'm sorry, but um, I think I got away from your original question uh, of very differentiations of the self. And, and some being much more um, basic or primitive, if we want to use that term, uh, in the sense of it's, it's archaic, it's original, um, versus uh, a more developed sense of self-consciousness that we have uh, as we mature. Yeah, and how it, and from the very, very beginning, the relationship of the archetypes to the developing self, you talk about as an art, uh, object relations, we can see externally how relationships events etc shape the development of the the little ego or self but there certainly is an internal um one might say or might say archetypal experience too that can be disrupted if it's not protected well enough and the idea i would think from fordham is that the archetypal uh, energies or patterns or whatever can overwhelm that state and also with dissociative identity disorder usually does not happen unless there is a major disruption at an early age of the integration or wholeness of a self and then so survival um the person is able to then um break up into different uh states some of which are persecutory some of which are protective and all. so um, maybe you know you said all you want to say about it but it just seems there's a lot there um, to understand uh, with the archetypes 
yeah i i i don't know how to again to resolve it how do i okay I'm just I'm, a question yeah okay thank you thank you Tony, go ahead uh, Dr. Mills, thank you so much. It's just, it's really, really fascinating. Some of the things you're talking about, and I'm actually working on uh, kind of looking at newer archetypes and going back to Jung's original writings. One of the things that really intrigued me was he posited them as evolutive across long periods of history. And hearing what you have to say, I mean, it's, it's interesting because I'm, I'm more of a Deleuzian than a Lacanian. And, um, but what you're talking about is a nice synthesis. I mean, uh, lack as a generative gap. I mean, Deleuze believed that ultimately the primordial ground was productive and not just based on absence. And what you're talking about is a fusion of the two, that the primordial ground, the lack creates the productivity. And I think that's the, the hook that I've been trying to take with looking at, okay, archetypes we know are evolutive. If we look at the sort of kind of anthropological history, the cultural history, and what you're talking about seems to add that that hook in there. And I really appreciate the fact you're looking at it from a naturalistic kind of point of view, rather than invoking the transcendent, um, which is a really, uh, it, it's, it just dovetails into uh, both Christoph and I come from a physics background. So it dovetails into like contemporary physics, contemporary information theory. Um, it just so much of what, what you said kind of makes sense, but I'm wondering if you could say if there's any thoughts you might have on this notion of the archetypes actually evolving across large periods of history. Well, um, I don't know if I, I have anything to, to say. I'm not an anthropologist, um, but by definition, it would, if, if, if civilization is based upon a developmental monistic ontology that 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 starts from an original form and it becomes more sophisticated over the eons. Um, then it would have to account for variation and change and epigenetic um, uh, transformations in archetypes themselves. So um, it wouldn't it wouldn't be incompatible. I think my my philosophical model wouldn't be incompatible at all with an evolutionary model or um, even bioscience uh, that that Eric uh, um, has illuminated. Um, the you know I come I come from it more as a Hegelian and, and looking at. Um, you're looking at whatever we want to call it, it's mind, spirit, uh, geist, you know, um, uh, is, is really the pro is a process of um, becoming. And it's a process of the coming into to being or coming into presence of pure self-consciousness that, that has been superimposed upon uh, culture and, our, and societies. Um, or we wouldn't have, we, we wouldn't be, who we are um, so it's a develop it's a developmental and evolutionary enrichment uh, over time and then you fill in the content based upon your particular um, cultural um, uh, you know uh, focus or our historical focus so we're not the same human beings as we were you know in the beginning um, and I think we've evolved, even though we see the world falling to pieces right now. Um, the Deleuzian dimension that you, you know, the, you know, this has a, a history in, in German idealism in general, the notion of potencies, you know, we have, we have anything from Kant to Fichte to Schelling and Hegel who, who, who gravitate toward this kind of um, language. And, and so Deleuze has inherited that. And of course, Lacan, you know, they're both sitting in on, on um, you know, Hippolyte's, uh, uh, you know, lectures on Hegel. So, I mean, they, 
they've selectively kind of snatched things, you know, and reappropriated them in their own theory, which is fine. We all do that. <laughs> so I, I, rather than an either or, why not? How do we address all these things? So I, I'm glad you're doing that. I guess go ahead on, on the, I'm sorry, uh, John, Jonathan, go ahead. Thank you so much. Um, that was, that was beautiful, uh, really beautiful articulation. Thank you so much. Um, love the idea of the doctrine of archetypes. Um, and I think even Jung talked about a dogma. Um, I, I wonder if you could just briefly define dialectic for yourself, that, that process that, and how, how it might extend from something impersonal to personal because uh, i think it's a really wonderful um sort of traction to you know for us in understanding the idea of the dialectic um and i know that has a broad and historical you know legacy so i'm wondering sure. if you could yeah thank you well thanks uh jonathan for for that um i guess i'm going to have to uh, i'll I'll respond by saying that I am, you know, his Hegel scholar. So I'll give you his definition, um, and then I'll give you my modification. For for Hegel, um, he he doesn't he. I'll say I'll start with the the negative uh, that he does not use a model that's called a, synth, a thesis antithesis synthesis. That is not Hegel. That would uh, that's just a, a bastardization of the a simplification of the phrase if anything that would be coming from fichte's vision shaft lira where he talks about the principles of thinking and judgment but even that's a simplistic uh, rendition for hegel um you have three uh, a simultaneous process uh, of, a, of a threefold movement that you name you you name it are any, anything we enter the system at any time, anytime we encounter any experience, it is mediated at, uh, immediately by entering into its opposition. And it, by entering into opposition, whether it be a thought, whether it be a, an emotion, whether it be a person, whether it be an external object in, 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 our, in our world, um, thought has to mediate that experience. And by doing so, it, 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 it cancels it. It goes beyond it. It, uh, it looks at the not, the, ne the negation. At the same time, it, it um, subsumes. It, um, it includes it. It retains it in its structure while it elevates itself to a new level. So it, in many ways, it's a, it's a self-transcending kind of process. Um, now, of course, Jung calls it the transcendent function, um, whatever we want to call that dialectic. Sometimes some dialectics are very simple based upon identity and difference and, and there's no mediation and, and there's firm rigid antithesis between the two. Others, there's much more of a subtle integration and um, uh, to, an elevation in the process and hence so that's why society in, in Hegel's uh, philosophy um, has, has developed over time and become more ethical uh, um, through, you know, th through our politics and, and, and social democracies, for instance, or through culture in general, um, invention of, uh, uh, of our cultural institutions, uh, of religion, of philosophy. This is all developmental achievements. Now, the dialectic, though, isn't necessarily on a steady progression to, um, to wholeness or health. It might become stagnated, it might regress, and it might be very selective in what it incorporates. And, and so in that, in that way, you have um, the complexity of, of the psyche. Um, so our conflicts or our complexes that drive who we are, whether it be individually or um, as a uh, collective, 
um, are very are, are themselves very complex. So, um, di so dialectical relations are are very dynamic process systems, and they're not just simple like you know. Uh, I don't even know how to describe it. You just can't, you know, simple splitting either or. But what do we see now in today's culture? A very simple binary. People think either this or that. Uh, it's like you are today's cultural wars. You know, you're the colonizer and you're the colonized, the victim, the victimizer. Th that's a simple dialectic. It hasn't achieved the complexity of the integration um, that I hope we're going to see in the future. Hmm. Thank you very much. Yeah. Mary Beth. Hi, John. Uh, thank you for a really excellent presentation. It's so great to have you and Eric here today. Um, <clears throat> two parts question. <laughs> One is when you were talking about your idea, your concept of developmental mon uh, monism or uh, development of the monism. I started thinking about Harold Atzmansbacher's uh, paper on dual aspect monism, and I just wondered if there was similarity or difference in some of your, your ideas about the development of the monad. And then also, um, if I'm understanding your proposal, you know, that this uh, self-generating split and um, dialectic that occurs that propels the archetype to, you know, in terms of its being drawn into being, what are, what are your thoughts in terms of the relationship of consciousness and when does consciousness become an issue or a factor? Um, and also, because given the Jungian concept of the interrelationship between consciousness and unconsciousness as both being um, generative with each other. Well, thank you, yeah, Mary Beth, for for again inviting me and Eric to speak um, and for your comments. Um, so a dual aspect monism um, is certainly, um, uh, I think, less complicated as a theory than a, a dualism. So um, you, you've got, you know, you, you've got different different folks from different uh, disciplines who are, who, are, who are dealing with this on different levels. So um, in one aspect, we could talk about it just in terms of like biological processes, meaning for human beings. On other levels, we could talk about it as uh, physics or as theology or as cosmogenies. Um, so I want to be careful about that. But if we, if I just keep it with the human being and the human psyche and, and social collectives, um, there, the notion of, and in, in Eric and I, you know, have been dialoguing about the mind body problem for quite a long time. And I have another book on the, the psychoanalysis and the mind body problem, uh, where Eric also has a, a chapter in that. So the, the notion um, uh, of mind and matter is, is something that I'm sure Eric's gonna talk about. Uh, but um, if you have a dual aspect that both, both are operative at the same time and they don't need to be ontologically separated. So you have to account uh, both for our embodiment um, meaning our physicality or material, uh, in the fact that we're in mattered, uh, whether you want to talk about the language of neuroscience or bioscience or whatever, um, that's perfectly um, legitimate as one aspect of psyche um, or the complexity of um, the human mind. The other side, just like Jung tries to get at, is um, uh, you know more of the psychic processes that would not be limiting to a reductive ontology 
meaning reduced right down to matter. So by, by having a dual aspect monism, you have both operative within some kind of unity. And, and that seems to be um, less controversial or less uh, contradictory than trying to separate mind from matter. And that's just in a nutshell. Um, so I hope I, I, I hope I answered that uh, okay. Now, again, it is a very big topic. I mean, a lot of people are drawn to these, these big metaphysical questions like, uh, is the universe all interrelated, integrated? Is it one? Um, is it psyche? Is it just uh, a sea of, um, you know, atoms and, uh, and energies? Uh, but do they have to be bifurcated in terms of material and immaterial language? Um, can't they be dialectically operative and mutually implicative at the same time? Can't they have certain gradations or hierarchies of, of development and sophistication? And then now you're asking, what is consciousness? And where does consciousness arise? And how does it arise? Uh, of course, the, the hard problem of consciousness is not so easy to, to answer. Um, and again, I'm going to leave that to our resident, uh, you know, um, mind-body philosopher, Eric good one to answer. Um, but if you look at consciousness being on a continuum, and you know, we this begs the question of what is consciousness, of course, but to me, you would have to start from a, a level of emergence out of, out of something that's not conscious, and you then become conscious of it. Uh, so hence a a monistic uh, ontology, developmental monistic ontology, would want to account for um, lower order forms that um, either multiply or differentiate themselves and become more sophisticated, uh, robust organizations that are still within a same unifying system. Now, of course, the system itself is not unified, but it's unifying, and it is a dynamic process uh, that accounts for, um, you know, the world of our becoming. So that, that that's if I'm trying to squeeze out of uh, the uh, resolving the riddle of the Sphinx here, um, that's my attempt. Thank you. Okay, I have 23 minutes after the hour. Um, it's time for a short five minute break. So we'll start this back up with Eric at 28 after, okay? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, so my name's Eric Goodwin, obviously. Um, real briefly, um, just kind of give you some background. I, I got interested in Jung when I was a resident. Um, so 15 years ago or so, and um, much to my uh, excitement, my department chair was not a huge fan of Jung. And so that was an inter inter interesting uh, journey in and of itself, uh, perhaps not quite as dramatic as John's, but uh, a near death experience of my own, as it were. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, despite that um, good natured teasing on his part, I mean, I couldn't stop anyway. I just uh, went wild with it. I got very fascinated with the concept of the archetype and um, really wanted to know more about it. Um, came at it from a very different angle that uh, that John has. And um, I have not read Hegel. I'm not familiar with Deleuze um, other than the name. You know, I know a little bit about these things, but not much. Instead, coming at it from the, the biological uh, point of view, the anthropological point of view later on, I added to that. Um, so I wanted to address three things today. Um, mainly, it kind of in response to some of the great questions that uh, arose as a result of John's uh, talk. 
And so to kind of further the discussion, I, I think um, the first is, is to kind of get into this business of the, uh, of the mind body problem, but I don't want to dominate the whole talk with that. Uh, Cause I've got some other things I think it would be fun to get into as well on the archetypes more in particular. Um, the book deals with this quite a bit more, but we do get into the, the weeds a little bit with the mind body problem. I just kind of give you all an, an idea. Um, <clears throat> one of the, I guess, discussion points that uh, that comes about in the book is when John is talking about the psyche um, from, from the perspective I was coming at it, which was philosophy of mind is the boundaries of the psyche. What, when, where does the personal psyche end? And I have come across Atman Spocker's work as well. We've talked about um, our different approaches. Uh, I don't think his approach and mine is necessarily in, uh, incompatible. I think John and my approach is, is very compatible. But just to give you a feel for what we talk about there um, in, in a few minutes, um, the mind-body problem is, of course, about the relationship to mind and body or matter and psyche. And, of course, the number one problem here is that these two things are kind of hard to, to really nail down in of themselves. If you go with a strictly dualistic point of view, um, a so-called Cartesian point of view, for example, you can claim with Descartes that mind and matter are ontologically distinct rather than just merely conceptually distinct. Doing that leads to all kinds of problems, however, and I don't want to overload the discussion with that. Um, phenomenologists have, have offered up some great critiques of that, but even within philosophy itself, we're seeing a whole lot more critis criticism of that point of view and this very similar point of view, which would be physicalism. And physicalism is the perspective that mind derives entirely from matter and is completely derivative of it. Um, now, what does this have to do with Jung? Well, Jung was not a philosopher. Um, I think he may have wanted to be, but he really just didn't, didn't come at this problem with enough gusto to really get out of some of the ambiguities. Nevertheless, he had very strong intuitions about this, and he was very much against a dualistic approach of saying that mind and matter are fully separate in some way, which is why he came up with the idea of the psychoid. And whatever it is your, you think of that concept, that's where, where it kind of led for him, I think. But here's a quote from him kind of expressing this, where he says, um, just as the body has an anatomical prehistory of millions of years, so also does the psychic system. And just as the human body today represents in each of its parts the result of this evolution, and everywhere still cho shows traces of its earlier stages, so the same may be said of the psyche. Uh, or Elsewhere, he says, psyche and matter are contained in one of the same world, and they're moreover in continuous contact with one another and ultimately rest on an irrepresentable transcendent factor and therefore, it's not only possible, but fairly probable that psyche and matter are two different aspects of one and the same thing. Okay, so this is one of the reasons why um, I think that Atman Spocker's work in particular on the dual aspect monism uh, point of perspective is so interesting because he, he clearly had that uh, point of view uh, from the beginning. Um, so... So how does that, what does that have to do with, with this now? So from, from the point of view of the philosophy of mind, the question then comes, what is the final relationship between mind and matter? Because we really can't talk much about archetypes until we get a hang on this and uh, a handle on this because Jung proposed all sorts of uh, sort of transcendent and almost cosmic um, definitions later in his life. Now, earlier in his life, he started with a merely biological point of view and just find them in bi biological terms, which I'm a big fan of, and uh, you can read my works to, to get into all that. Um, I actually don't think that it's incompatible with the biological formulation to go deeper into this and viewing archetypes as fundamental organizers of experience or mind slash matter. Uh, I think it's a natural progression, really. But before we get into <clears throat> before we get it too deep into that, 
let's take a look at physicalism. Okay. So physicalism, I'm, I'm going to spend a, just a minute on that because it's a very popular view among philosophers of mind. And um, it's essentially the idea that mind, that matter is fundamental. It's prior to, or excuse me, matter is, is fundamental and prior to mind. And that we should be able to explain someday with super advanced neuroscience, maybe, uh, how it is that buzzing neurons can somehow create things like the sound of a melody or the taste of Guinness, all right, or something like that. How in the world that works is is left open to future discoveries, but uh, physicalists maintain, though, that that must be the only way it can possibly work. So I believe personally that physicalism is completely incompatible with Jungian theory. And um, this is one of the reasons why we, we need to understand the problems with it, because I think if it turned out to be the, the correct metaphysics, then we would have to radically restructure Jungian theory. Okay, and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, first of all is what they call the explanatory gap problem. So the explanatory gap problem is Basically, isolated molecules or even cells do not appear to have any sort of conscious awareness or qualia, if you're familiar with that term. A qualia are subjective qualities of experience, um, colors, sounds. Um, Thomas Nagel, for example, talks about how we may be able to understand the vibrations of air and how it operates on the oral nerve, but that still doesn't really explain why sounds sound the way they do versus some other some other way. Or another way to put this would be using pain fibers. Um, we can describe quite accurately that when pain fibers fire, the person attached to those pain fibers will complain and say that that hurts. But what we can't explain is why pain fibers firing feels like ouch rather than some other thing it could potentially be. That's That's the explanatory gap problem right there. So where do, these, where do these qualia come from, these phenomenal characteristics? Um, aggregates of, and isolated bits of matter are not conscious, but when you arrange them just so, they are. Put another way, um, the human body is composed of carbon, nitrogen, hydrogen, and oxygen. A, a living human body will be composed of all four of those things and some trace elements. A dead body is also composed of those four trace elements, of those four elements and other trace things. So what's the difference? Well, clearly there's a huge difference between a living body and a dead one. So what's up with that? So it's the same kind of thing. Now, um, this has led certain philosophers, most famously David Chalmers, to propose what he called the hard problem of, con of consciousness, which John brought up. And the hard problem of consciousness is hard because this is it, is how do I span this explanatory gap? How do I get from buzzing neurons to, um, you know, ode to joy? How does that work? Um, the, e the easy problem of consciousness is identifying the correlates, the neural correlates of consciousness, which we're very close to being able to do with quite a bit of detail now. Um, but so what? It right? doesn't really get at what philosophers want to know. Okay, it may satisfy neuroscientists, but um, not many others. So philosophers have tried to get around this issue a number of different ways. Um, one of them is identity theory, which is to say that um, that the buzzing neurons and the experience are simply a, the same thing. And it's a semantic problem. Yeah, the counter argument to that is is quite extensive, but I'll just leave that one to you. I think it's absurd. They're clearly different. If they're not distinguishable, then they're identical, but these are clearly distinguishable. Okay. The other one is eliminativism, which is a really kind of curious position, if you ask me. And it's one that Daniel Dennett and Susan Blackmore have put before us that the idea that consciousness is an illusion or it doesn't exist. So, uh, you know, I mean, it just makes me wonder who it is that came up with this theory then, since they're arguing themselves out of existence, essentially. But hey, what do I know? Um, I'm not a huge fan of it, obviously. I think it's absurd. Um, and it the 
way to get to, I guess, counter this eliminativist attempt to get over the explanatory gap problem. The way I put it is, okay, fine. Let's assume that you're correct and that consciousness is a convenient fiction that the brain creates in order to function. And it conjures up a world that is, is coherent and unified, even though its origin is in multi, in multiplicity within neurons firing and doing all of their shenanigans and so forth. Even if you assume that and you say what it, what it appears to be is not what it really is, it's an illusion, that doesn't get rid of it. That tells, all that does is it sidesteps the problem. Okay? In other words, a, a dollar bill in my hand may not really be worth anything, but I've still got to explain the dollar. Right. So there's something there that we're seeing and just calling an illusion doesn't magically get rid of it. So that's that's that. So. Now. The way that I approach this is I look at this as a part whole problem, essentially. There's a few other folks that have looked at it like this before. Philip Goff, for example, is one. Um, my approach is pretty similar to his. And um, there's some other folks out there, too. But the idea is essentially um, emerges from a famous paper by Jonathan Schaefer. It came out in 2010. It was talking about the priority of the whole. I don't know if anybody's familiar with this paper, but it's, uh, okay, I got a couple of people nodding there. Uh, yeah. Now, I, I talked to Schaefer about his paper as I was working on my own paper on philosophy of mind. And he told me something that really shocked me was that he was a physicalist. He said, I'm just a garden variety physicalist. And I thought, how in the world can you justify that point of view, given this, this fact that you've argued so eloquently that the whole is prior to the parts? But the, the essential, I guess, difference that we had was that he did not feel that consciousness should be viewed in that sense as a whole or a property of a whole. And that's the way I'm looking at it. All right. So the, the common feature here is the murology of it. In other words, which is prior, the whole or the part? Do the properties of the parts ever arise from the property of the whole from which they were pulled? Or is it the other way around? Do properties of wholes come solely from the properties of parts? Okay, so a little bit of reflection will reveal to you that there are plenty of cases where the wholes have properties that the parts don't have, right? There's a whole field of uh, mathematics that is devoted to this, right? complex theory. Uh, complex systems theory, what they used to call chaos theory. Um, and it's in particular types of holes, the interactiveness and the integratedness of it is so dense that new properties come emergent there. Now, so um, John was talking a little bit earlier about supervenience and uh, saying this is one of the problems. And it is a problem in the sense that we have to explain where these properties come from. Since they don't come from the parts, from whence do they emerge, <laughs> right? Now, if you think about this really closely, you'll realize this is the same problem as the mind-body problem. It's saying, I've got neurons, I've got the body, I've got all these molecules and everything, and they're working just so, and from that I have consciousness. That's a property of the whole that if you separated them all, if you took all of the... Um, you know, billions of neurons in the brain and put them each separately in its own Petri dish, you wouldn't have a consciousness from that. Not a human consciousness anyway. You might have individual neuron consciousnesses, but that's a different question. You've got to put them all together and let them work together and then you have it. Okay, so then where does that come from? So uh, this, this point of view of essentially proposing that the properties of the whole are prior to the properties of the parts is basically flipping the usual way people tend to look at it. Now I say the usual way, yeah, and within the last hundred years or so, sure. The physicalist position has been more dominant, but if you go further back into um, history of uh, ideas, you'll see that the other way around is actually pretty common uh, all the way on back. Uh, the Neoplatonists, for example, would, would be a great example of how they view the one as the source of all properties and all everythings through their emanations. And I don't think we have to use emanations uh, per se, 
Um, but again, we if you want to get into the weeds on that, you can read the book because John and I get into the weeds with that one. But the general principle uh, is that a holistic view of consciousness is the only way that really gets around the hard problem without just creating more problems because it says the the way that that matter creates mind is that it doesn't <laughs> and so, instead it's um that consciousness or mind is a property of a holistic system operating in just so just so as as it needs to in order to generate that okay so then um that often will lead to questions of okay well then how is it that you've got a embryo say and then it's developing along and now all of a sudden it's conscious where did that consciousness come from within this paradigm so within this paradigm i'm not going i'm not allowed to say that adding more neurons and atoms to the uh, embryo um, and the properties therein somehow creates consciousness no what i'm saying is as the the body develops it be, it acquires a form that correlates with consciousness more and more and more as it develops. So I'm, I'm moving towards a form which is conducive to or correlative with that property. Now, if I do that, then I have to keep going. There's nothing that says I have to stop at one person. Okay. Now, if you're, pay, if you're paying close attention to the type of, of panpsychism, all right. Panpsychism says psyche is, is a fundamental feature of the universe. This is a, actually much more a popular position now than it was even five years ago. Um, and Chalmers was one of the first ones to really solidify a powerful argument for panpsychism. Now, here's the problem, though. With panpsychism, you've got two broad varieties. You've got micropsychism, which says each individual molecule in the entire universe has its own little micropsyche. Uh, and if you say that, then you have bought yourself something called the combination problem, which is, okay, let's assume each individual neuron has its own little micro neuron psyche. Why is it that jamming them together gives you one macro psyche, right? William James proposed this as a, a famous combination problem. And there's been other versions of this uh, throughout the, uh, throughout the history of ideas, but if you'll notice, though, that's still a part whole problem. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. It's saying the properties of the whole are somehow being derived from the properties of the parts. And how does that work? Now, I didn't notice this until I came across Marsilio Ficino, of all people. And when I was reading his Platonic ontology uh, or Platonic theology, he goes through this very simple argument um for holism and says essentially how in the world is it we're expecting a unity to come from multiplicity that's contradictory and as soon as i read that i thought there it is that's the problem that's the problem that these people are doing that's the hard problem with consciousness that's the binding problem in neuroscience if you're familiar with that um and it's the combination problem all in a nutshell and the only way to get around it that I can see, unless someone comes up with some other miraculous way, is to say, you know what? It's got to be the other way around. It's got to be that the properties of the whole are prior. And that the only reason you get them is because you move towards a form which brings them into existence. So then what that means is the, the closer you are to that form, the more you will have consciousness emerge within that system. And there's either one most potentially integrated form in the universe, or you have to say it's the entire universe itself. So this is really an argument for cosmopsychism. Okay. Um, and I've already gone on more over more of that than I really wanted to. So <laughs> that's the ontology that I think works best to solve the mind-body problem. And I believe it's fully compatible with the way John has described it from, I think, in his view, a much more modest position of saying, well, okay, but let's just look at it from the human uh, lens. And that's totally fair. <laughs> that's totally fair. Uh, I do not blame that. Now, a couple of other things that were brought up in the discussion session I wanted to address, because they, they impinge on this, 
that's our foundation, whether you accept the cosmos, cosmos psychist uh, analysis or not. What we're really both talking about is having things emerge into consciousness spontaneously that have a profound effect and they have this recurrent nature, the archetypes. So um, what, what, and, and the otherness that John spoke of that as a quality. Okay. So it's, it's that feature of them, I think is extremely important. And something that I've been working on more recently, and I saw uh, several folks working on in uh, Zurich earlier this year, was the concept of spontaneous thought. Okay, so spontaneous thought is a field of neuroscience that has gained quite a bit of momentum in the last 10 years. And it emerged really from just a simple question of what is the brain doing when you're not doing anything? If you're just sitting there vibing, and you're not working on any particular problems, is the brain just dormant? Or is it doing stuff? Okay, well, obviously it's the latter uh, because nature abhors a vacuum and it's also very stingy with energy resources. And um, if you're not working actively on some kind of conscious uh, puzzle or problem or issue, it reverts to what they call the default mode. And there's been a lot of interesting neuroscience about that. But then the question is, okay, well, what is the default mode doing? Like, what's the point of it? And we'll get to this features that John pointed out earlier as we go, because they're evident there. That's um, what I think is really, really neat about this. So before we get to archetypes, I just want to have a few words on this idea of the spontaneous thought, because they, they're very, very closely related. So um, archetypal images emerge in a non-willfully directed way. So they are a subset of spontaneous thought in general. So if we look at the science of spontaneous thought, how it works and what it's accomplishing, we may be able to look at some of those and say, are, are some of those spontaneous thoughts, can they be definable as archetypal? And of course, I think they, they definitely they are. Um, and um, the, the key feature of spontaneous thought is that it is not willfully directed. Very important feature. And it's something that Jung and von Franz talk about in their work. Uh, Warren Coleman has talked about it in some of his work um, on the emergence of the imagination. Great stuff, even though he doesn't believe that archetypes exist and he criticizes some of my work, but that's okay. Uh, I'll let him live anyway. Um, but it's fascinating the way that um, that feature, which I think has such profound uh, implications for archetype theory, hasn't been talked about enough. So I'm gonna talk about it more. And um, generally speaking, when you look at the, if, if you dive into the literature of spontaneous thought, um, which I, I won't do and get too deep in the weeds on that, but if you dive into it, what you can find is that the thoughts that emerge seemingly out of the blue, that don't have anything to, to do necessarily with what you're working on in the moment, often have very common features, okay? They, and they seem to be very beneficial as well. Number one, they're non-random, which I think any psychoanalyst with their salt would have told you. We all knew that already, but they, of course, they had to rule that out because they're neuroscientists and they have to, you know, be that way. So that's one feature. It's not random chimerical wish fulfillments either. It's Spontaneous thoughts have uh, features of working on current emotionally relevant problems and or they are occupied with future planning um, and anxieties that center around future planning. They are all colored by those current features. Okay. They're focused on emotionally salient personal concerns. They involve memory consolidation and future planning. Um, also relevant to current issues. Um, it, it can, it can misfire. It can go wrong, which you see in obsessions or ruminations, but for the most part in the, in the normal situation, they're working on making our lives better, if you will. Like there, there's a, a process in the psyche that says, I need to put this stuff together. I need to figure out where I am and what it all means and who I am. Um, so, uh, 
this interestingly enough this this science has become so um I guess prevalent that uh, well, one of the ones that I quote in a, a paper that I'll, will be coming out soon says that we should really call this the era of the wandering mind, because that's another name for spontaneous thought is study of wandering of wandering thoughts or wandering mind thoughts. Um, in fact, once one researcher says that we sh we should uh, we shouldn't call it mind wandering, we should call it mind ordering, because that seems to be what the function of these thoughts is. Um, so now you can see this not only in just spontaneous thoughts that pop up, but in dreams, because dreams are now being more and more recognized as just another type of spontaneous thought that happens while we're asleep. They tend to be more vivid and more intense, but they still follow the same patterns in terms of their characteristics and features. Um, <clears throat> so the, the long story short of this is that what we know about spontaneous thought from this body of research matches pretty closely what Jung called the transcendent function. So now if we get into that, now the transcendent function, well, what is that? That's the a unconscious process that is working towards integration. That's the short definition, right? We've all heard that. And its uh, its focus is on continually operating in the background and it, it will order dream content as well. Um, and so I think that's, that's a great way of looking at uh, this, this new research and spontaneous thought as the, our old friend, the transcendent function. Why? Because what the research says is basically that these thoughts are oriented around as the same stuff that Jung was talking about. He says that um, or excuse me, they, the researchers are saying that spontaneous thoughts generally focus on autobiographical, autobiographical self-narrative with as much context as possible. They orient towards meaning and identity creation uh, and affectively oriented context creation. And I think one of the best ways you can categorize it in your mind is that what the function of this process is, is to answer the question, who am I? Now, the question, uh, who am I, doesn't mean you, you navel gaze endlessly into the bottomless depths and emer out emerges this, you know, magical definition. No, the nuts and bolts of it operate more simply. It's how do I connect with this person? How do I connect with that person? How do I connect with society? How do I connect with the world? This connects into religious ideas because they ask, who are you in the context of the entire universe and the eternity? Same thing, same thing. And it's always operating on the background, no matter what we're doing. Um, it is flexible too. If we're under less stress, it becomes more playful. It becomes more exploratory. And you see this in dream content as well, which is why Jung said that a person who is not really distressed as they get better their dreams become harder to uh, interpret rather than easier which i'm sure everyone has has noticed that but when we're under a lot of stress when we're really struggling it becomes easier to interpret it because they narrow the focus down on the most emotionally salient issues that we're dealing with right now and this applies not only to spontaneous self dreams and as i was reading this i was thinking oh this is just what psychoanalysts have been saying since the early days that if you pay close attention to what emerges spontaneously uh, without direction, without judgment, and just let it process and bring into awareness or, or um, focus specifically without trying to direct the imagery and see where it comes in and um, attend to it closely. Well, what's that called? <laughs> Active imagination, right? <laughs> So they've even done studies on that. They didn't know that's what they were doing, but that's what they were doing. They were studying this process and they found that lo and behold, especially when it's image heavy, it leads to a reduction of symptoms depending on whatever it is they're working on. Wow, that's cool. Okay, so then <laughs> how does that, two questions jump out at, here, at me here. One is how does this relate to what John was talking about? at the deepest fundamental level of the descriptions that he gives of how these archetypes emerge. And all of this to me says, well, look, he discussed the intentionality behind it. 
he, he discussed the um, relation to lack. So the lack would be the emotional uh, valence, I think, because emotions essentially um, evolved in order for us to solve particular environmental problems and they motivate behavior towards or away from whatever it may be, whether it's rage, it's lust, it's hunger, <laughs> or uh, you know, um, grief, all of these things and <clears throat> have evolved within the human context to solve various problems. Well, that's the intentionality behind them. Um, now, if we have time, we can get into how that relates to um, the question that was raised about uh, the social identity disorder. It was a really good question. I have worked with some uh, patients um, with the social identity disorder and the social amnesia. So we can get into that if you want to. Um, but anyway, so now, how does that then relate to the question of the archetypes? That's the other piece that jumps out. Um, so we're already getting clo pretty close to the way John described how they emerge when you look really closely at the phenomenology of them and the characteristics that they display. And I think what, what you have to do, if you're going to come at it from this other angle, from this neuroscience angle that I'm doing, we have to take a look at the idea of embodied cognition and answer the question of, okay, given that we have spontaneous thoughts that are purposeful and oriented towards solving particular emotional problems, is it possible that a subset of those are purely innately driven? Because what, these, what we know about spontaneous thoughts, not only about what they're trying to do, but how they're constructed. And particularly, you can see this in, in dreams, but um, spontaneous thoughts are not just regurgitations of memories. They're not just retreading of stuff that's happened to you. There wouldn't be much point in that, really. And, and even in the case of, of uh, memory consolidation, which it is a part of that process, memory consolidation, as we all know, is not a perfect reproduction of what happened. Memory, in fact, is not a process of storing things that are retrieved later. You've all heard these computer metaphors. That's garbage. It doesn't work like that at all. In fact, memory retrieval, if you will, it should not even really be called that. It should be called an imaginary construction of something that more or less resembles something that happened to you. Uh, a week ago or 10 days, you know, 10 years ago or whatever it is. It's all using the imagination, okay? So that's how important that is. So even in that process, even in the process of memory consolidation, it's not just regurgitating of uh, past events. As John pointed out, there is a creativity behind this. There is a non-determinate nature to this. And I, I don't have a problem with uh, with free will because I say, well, that's just another pro property of a system that's complex enough. Boom, there you go. I don't need to <laughs> I don't need to get any deeper into it than that. Uh, of course, that troubles many people out there, but uh, I think both of us would certainly agree that that there is a freedom here, and it's very powerful. And I think if we didn't have it, we wouldn't have survived at this point already. So clearly, it's uh, adaptive. Okay, so. As it's creating these, um, as it's creating these solutions and it's creating these images and so forth, what it's doing is it's taking the memories that have happened to us and breaking them down into pieces, and then reorganizing them into new narratives, new images. And I argue that what, in particular, in dreams, what they're doing is, whereas memory consolidation is a part of dreaming and spontaneous thought, there's another layer. The first layer of memory consolidation is important. It tells us here is a here is a coherent narrative of my life up to this point in terms of the events that have occurred. This, then this, then this, then this. But the psyche doesn't stop there. The psyche, the psyche says, okay, that's cool. Now let's break it all up and come up with a new narrative and image that expresses what it actually means. Okay, so I've got what happened and then what it means. And what it means uses symbolism. And, and the reason it uses symbolism is because symbolism is a great way to embody a huge amount of information in a very compact and easy to remember form. Okay, so <clears throat> it's no shock or surprise that a significant chunk of spontaneous thoughts are actually images like this that you can analyze just like dreams. Well, isn't that what psychoanalysts have been doing and saying for a long time? Yes. So. This is independent um, 
you know, corroboration, if you will, not that we really need that, but it's just an independent uh, view into this process and they're coming to the same conclusion. Um, one set of data is working with folks in, um, in a clinical setting. And then the other, uh, another orientation is these various studies that they use with neuroscientific tools. And it's fun that they both come together. <laughs> All right, so now, um, one thing to learn about the symbolism, All right, now we're not to archetypes yet, but we're getting there. One thing that's important about the symbolism is that it is embodied, okay? So what does that mean? Embodied cognition is a subfield of psychology that emerged in the 80s, starting with J uh, George Lakoff, um, view of the metaphors we live by, uh, Lakoff and Johnson, excuse me, famous, uh, famous book called Metaphors We, uh, we Live By. And the, the information has progressed since then. And long story short is that the human mind tends to create and think in metaphors because of their conceptual power. And these are embodied metaphors. In other words, it tends to do things like um, take very abstract and difficult to define concepts and map them onto things that are concrete and visual spatial. The example that they give in uh, metaphors we live by is love is a journey. And it takes the concept of love, which is nebulous in the extreme, and maps it onto this idea of a physical journey through time and space. And, and they note how when people talk about it, they use this metaphor as an underlying metaphor all the time. They talk about how we're in different places, we're going in different directions, we're not together on this, and we're, you know, all that kind of stuff. And um, they identify many, many, many other examples like this. And if you read that work and the subsequent work, you can see a lot of this. You can see how we organize um, the concept of happiness as up, for example. We'll say I'm flying high with good feelings. I'm on cloud nine. Whereas we describe depression, which is already within the, within the descriptor itself, depression as down. I'm feeling down in the dumps. Um, I'm depressed. Uh, there's a whole slew of these that I go over some in Neurobiology of the Gods, but um, there's, there's plenty more. Attachment loss is cold is another one. So-and-so uh, left me out in the cold. So-and-so uh, gave me the cold shoulder, right? Whereas the opposite is also another metaphor that we use. All Why do we do this? Well, I think the reason is because of the embodiedness of cognition. So this is kind of feeds into the idea of the mind-body problem also. Because what we're doing is we're saying that it, it matter has a psyche to it. It has a psychological dimension to it. And at the same time, psyche is in mattered. It's embodied in a very, uh, very strong sense. So now I argue that this dimension is required if we're going to talk about archetypes. And uh, many of the Jungian uh, authors and post-Jungians and so forth have talked a lot about how the archetypal images are very symbolic. And they do the same sort of thing. They take a difficult to describe or um, verbalize concept and they map it onto a symbol so that we can get a better handle on it. Now, when you do that, what you do is you bring in what they call in embodied cognition an ineffable core of meaning. Um, and the best way to describe that is to just look at the fact that if you were to describe the metaphor, say, of danger is darkness, a very commonly used metaphor. Um, it's found in all sorts of fairy tales of going into the dark forest um, or, you know, joining the dark side, right? It's in, in a lot of popular media. It's all of this kind of danger. The unknown is mapped to darkness as an image. Now, danger is not literally the same thing as darkness. It's a metaphor. But how do you describe it? The only way to describe it because of this ineffable core of meaning that all metaphors have is to use other metaphors. <laughs> All right. So that's a very key feature here. And I argue that why that the archetypal nature of this comes from that there's a, the fact that there's a subset of these that utilize the human body as the basis for the metaphor. And the 
these are universal physiological elements of the human body. All right, this gets to the question too of do archetypes evolve? So I'm gonna to get to that. Whoever it was that asked that question, because it's a great question. Okay. So now I think that this ineffable core of meaning that metaphors have gets at a lot of the so-called mysticism that Jung is accused of. Because, and you know, Hillman even too, when he talks about how the archetypes defy final analysis. Um, they have, they're capable of endlessly being articulated verbally. Um, Roger Brooke, who I greatly admire his work, talks about this too, and how archetypes seem to be mysterious, deep, remote, frightening, enchanting. Thinking about them remains equally murky and ambivalent. Okay, now I look at that and I say, that's, that's due to the ineffable core of meaning that metaphors have. It's not because the archetype needs to be that muddy and impossible to understand. It's because the archetypal image is a symbol so in other words, the moon may be mysterious, but the finger pointing at it doesn't have to be so bloody mysterious, okay? So I think if we're making this distinction, we don't have to be quite so um, challenged in our understanding of what an archetype is. Okay, so now the biological dimension of this that I see in all of the various archetypal images that we've seen and talked about throughout Jungian literature, the child, the mother, the eternal youth, the hero, the divine marriage, the sacrifice. These are all fundamental human occurrences. These are fundamental environmental, uh, evo environmentally evoked responses that the spontaneously thinking psyche will come up with. And it'll use these metaphors that are found in all human beings to create these narratives of meaning. Oh, that's what this means. I'm dealing out to answer my own question earlier, the ceremony of the warrior returning, it was his way of coming up with that feeling of needing to be integrated. Well, how do I describe that? How do I create an image of that in my dream? Boom, it was the urban combat, the, the bloody uniform, the people looking at him that were all drunk and then returning back to it because the dream is telling us where we are right now. And that's what spontaneous thoughts do that too. <laughs> and it was like the psyche had not quite figured out the correct solution to this, which is why the bomb couldn't, couldn't be diffused, right? The ego couldn't figure it out. So poof, you wound up with the explosion. So now integrating archetypal theory with embodied metaphor theory is the final step here to get at what an archetypal image is. Um, and that's a spontaneously affectively charged complex metaphor of our current life situation, those emerge spontaneously all the time. But there's a subset of those that use primarily innate metaphorical associations. Okay, so one of the things that they that they dis discovered about embodied metaphors is that you have a lot of complex metaphors, but they are can easily dis uh, decompose into these primary metaphors. They can't be further decomposed. Okay, happy is up. Sadness is down, uh, affection is warmth, danger is darkness, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Now, I argue that some of them, some of those, those primary metaphors are innate, meaning that they derive solely from our own human bodied experience. And that's, that's why they can be labeled as innate. I don't need to learn that danger is darkness because I'm a member of a species that has lousy night vision and I feel really uncomfortable in the darkness. And so then that metaphor can be used in any of my spontaneous thoughts, and it'll be found in any human being, in any culture, anywhere. And that, I think, speaks to what John was talking about as the essence of the archetypes spread out. And I think John brought up the question, why is that? How is that accomplished? And I think this might give us a clue as to one of the reasons why. It's because the in, in a very, I think, real sense, we can argue that the collective unconsciousness is the human body because the psyche uses the body in this way to construct so many of these metaphors. And there's good, there's a ton of them. There's a ton of them that I've identified. And I'm sure there's others that people will find. Uh, the danger is darkness. Well, the opposite of that, knowledge, safety, happiness is light. Uh, power or happiness is up followed by weakness and uh, sadness is down. Um, all of these you can identify as 
spontaneously emergent because of our human physiology. And in fact, you can even see this in people born blind. They're still able to understand these metaphors with no problem. So I don't even think you need to have any particular experiences to feed into these, no matter how generic and universal those experiences might be, that we're just set up for these sorts of primary metaphors. Understanding is grasping. Understanding is grasping is a metaphor that would make absolutely no sense to a horse. If a horse could think like a human and construct metaphors, they wouldn't do that. Rats would never come up with danger is darkness because they're safer in the darkness. They would have light is dark, is uh, dangerous light. <laughs> so um, it, it's not so much that the experience needs to occur. It's what our natural innate response to that experience is that gives us the innate quality that we're talking about for an archetypal image. Okay, this is why worldwide you have children who are uh, many, many children afraid of the dark, but there are very, very few children afraid of the light. And, and if that's the case, that probably has to do with some kind of photophobia, and a, you know, very, a variety of rare conditions that can cause that. But even in that sense, it's not really a phobia. It's it, that it hurts. But children are afraid of the dark. There aren't any children afraid of light that, that run away from it. <laughs> okay, so you get the idea. Whereas if we were owls, right, we wouldn't do that either because that's when we're hunting. It's when the fun is. It's when it's dark. And we, we would be able to function very highly in that environment. Okay, so a long story short then is that <clears throat> you can take these primary metaphors to construct. And this answers the question of whether or not they evolve. Every human being is, as by, by virtue of the human genome and the way that the psyche develops naturally, are going to have a whole alphabet of these primary, what I call innate mappings. Their innate mappings anybody would have anywhere because they have a human body. Um, and they are able to then use them to construct all sorts of images that are going to pop up in these spontaneous thoughts and dreams. Um, anger is heat is another one. Or I'll, I'll, I'll end with this one because this is one of my favorite ones. Anger is heat fuels a whole lot of metaphors. Boiling over with anger, burning with rage, blah, 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 blah. Okay. Now, I brought this up with uh, Christian Rusler this, uh, this past summer. And uh, he said, well, yeah, but you still have to have the experience that goes along with it. And so he was trying to say that it's not innate, uh, which I think misses the point. Um, if, our, if our body temperature went down when we got angry, we would not construct this metaphor, but we do, it goes up. But even in the case, all right, so even still, even still, if it's only something that's just learned, we, we say this because we hear other people say, comparing anger with heat, it has nothing to do with the biology, then it should not be found in, in other languages, okay? It, sh it should be fairly un unique to, or idiosyncratic to English, but it isn't. Uh, the anger is heat metaphor has been found in Eng English, Chinese, Japanese, Hungarian, Tahitian, Chickasaw, and Wolof so far as guiding underlying meta primary metaphors to guide these different types of uh, complex metaphors. Universal, universal. So I think that putting this together in this manner helps us define archetypal images in, with a great deal of clarity and precision and kind of demystifies them to agree to a degree, although it doesn't necessarily demystify the ultimate meaning of the archetypes because that can't really be gotten at because it's an ineffable core of metaphorical meaning. But we can at least, we can at least get a better handle on the imagery now, what, what leads to this process happening, I think, is what John identifies so well in his investigations and what must occur in order for these things to be built. And I think there's definitely more work we could do, John, on this connecting the bridging these processes, because I see a lot of what you talk about in this process uh, here. Um, and also, we can this, this you, doing it this way means we can also look at spontaneous thoughts and identify which ones are archetypal and which ones are not. Because the ones that aren't, aren't are going to be the ones that are not created with uh, innate mappings. For example, there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of metaphors in Chinese that organize around the primary metaphor that happiness is flowers in the heart. That's not an innate mapping because flowers are not, automatically emergent from the human body, right? So that's a cultural metaphor.
more. You could argue that that's at the cultural layer, and you'll see. I'm sure you'll see that. Um, in Zulu, they have anger is the grinding of corn, right? Also not innate. So when you see things that are organized around those, you can say, okay, that's not an archetypal. It may still have loads of meaning that you can analyze and explore. But now I've got a way to say, this is archetypal and this isn't. And we haven't had that in Jung's theory for ever, <laughs> I think. And there's been plenty of people that argue that practically everything is an archetype, right? So um, I think this, this does confer some advantages here. Um, so in conclusion, I'll wrap this up and say that I think an archetypal image can be clearly and identify, ident clearly and um, easily identified as a spontaneous affect charge complex metaphor for one's current species specific typical life situation that is mainly composed of innate mappings. And um, <clears throat> from there, we have a number of advantages. Number one, we can assess what is archetypal and what is not. It's falsifiable. I can I, we can. We can do like we did with anger with heat, go cross culturally and see if it see if it's there too. And if it is, that's much more likely that it's an innate mapping. All the innate mappings that I propose can be like done like this. Um, it even helps us interpret the images too. If I have an understanding of why the body and the psyche using the body constructs metaphors in a particular way, given our unique physiology, then I can work the other way at an image that I might be mystified by and say, ah, oh, okay, so there's a lot of heat here. I wonder if anger is a part of this imagery where it may not be obvious in the clinic, clinical setting. So it gives us a few more tools that we can use to understand and interpret those things. Um, it helps us to understand why archetypal image can be so elusive and mysterious too, because it, it is a metaphor and it's constructed in order to express a human experience that might not be verbalizable. And, and because we, th we th have thought in imagery as a species far longer than we've thought in words, and in fact, cross, cross species, that's probably the case since most of them don't have languages. Um, although we are finding that more species have languages than we originally thought. Nevertheless, the, the ability to think in imagery and to use metaphorical imagery is probably not anywhere near um, as new as verbalizing and constructing languages. Um, so my apologies to Lacan for that. Anyway, uh, we can also look at how archetypal images, despite their biological origin, do not have to be rigid. They can respond to large cultural shifts because the innate alphabet will not change, but the way that the alphabet organizes symbolism may be quite different depending on where you are in your culture. And those expressions of the spirit of the depths that is talked about is, is gonna be still possible to use with innate mappings, but they're gonna be potentially different depending on, the, on the, where you are in the you know, a long, long-term, long-scale changes. And then finally, it helps us to understand why mythic narratives can look so similar, but they're not identical worldwide. If they were identical, this would be a whole lot easier. We would just say we have an automatic tendency to do this, right? Boom, there it is. But it's not that way. It's because the alphabet is identical, but the words that are constructed with that alphabet are not necessarily going to be the same. Nevertheless, there's still going to be this sneaky similarity that dogs us Jungians <laughs> and mythographers across the world. Um, and so, Hopefully that sheds more light on my point of view and how I think it integrates with John's and I look forward to any questions. I think I went over a little bit, sorry. <laughs> so Thank fire you, away. David. Yeah, if you have a question, just raise your hand. Ah, John, there you go, go ahead. Hi, thanks again. Um, uh, because of what, a lot of what you described to me it sounds like a complex. I'm wondering if you could differentiate a complex from then the archetypal expression that you're describing. Um, I think the difference between the two would be the level of universality of it and and where we choose to draw the line between the complex, which is supposedly 
has an archetypal core of meaning to it and the archetype itself. So uh, it's a great question. I hadn't actually thought of that um, specifically, but it's uh, you know, something to worth worth exploring. Where Where is the line cut off? I would think that the complex would be more local and more specific and use less innate content, but mm -hmm. I could be wrong about that. Thanks. The other thing I was wondering about is um, being more of a sometimes what I call a secular union, union or whatever, is that the universal universality we're talking about, to me, is just that there are only so many ways to be human and so many ways that we can, humans can have experience. So they'll factor down into archetypal experiences. Um, Absolutely. And that sounds to me like what you're describing. Yeah, oh, you can certainly look at it that way. Um, there, there, it was a paper I wrote um, back in 2013 that talks about how I think that another way of looking at the archetype, archetypal image, um, is that it is an attractor state. And uh, if you imagine a narrative field of possible narratives that they funnel down into these attractor states because of common universal constraints and biases on the way that we think. And it's a great way of putting it. There's only so many ways to be human. <laughs> uh, absolutely. Now, does that mean that the expression itself doesn't reach further or deeper into a more universal uh, truth of some kind? I don't know. I, my, myself, I feel like it does, but I could be wrong about that. Okay, thanks. And I fully concede my, my ignorance in that. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Who else? Go ahead, Jody. I mean, this is fantastic, Dr. Godwin. I mean, it's it's what you're really talking about here is the construction of kind of a, a Jungian neuropsychoanalysis, which has been severely lacking in our field. Um, yeah. I mean, it's just it's just fascinating. And I was actually thinking the same question with regards to differentiating the complex and the archetype. I mean, for me, the first answer that pops up is that complexes tend to have more uh, immediate somatic activations and uh, of a greater intensity. Um, at least that's that's what I've seen when working somatically with patients that are sort oh, of yeah. seized by a complex is that then, then then we can get to the meaning. We can get to the images afterwards. Of course, and you could also argue too that the state of the ego strength will make make a big difference in here. Like as someone brought up uh, Fordham and the development, and how the sometimes archetypal forces can be overwhelming, and how that sometimes maybe even leads to dissociative identity and so forth. Um, absolutely, and so that's another piece of the puzzle because the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, right? That's the bottom line here, and that might be one differentiating factor, right? So, well, but yeah, just... to bring up neuropsychoanalysis, um, you know, Psalms, if, I'm sure you've heard of Mark Psalms, yeah, exactly. and uh, he's a great guy, but I think he's very, very wed to Freud and really wants to just prove that Freud was right. And I'm not, not really on a mission like that. I'm not trying to prove that Jung was right. Um, I initially started reading Jung, trying to find ways in which he might be wrong. I was very much a physicalist at the time, even myself, and I just couldn't figure out how to undo it, you know, and I kept making, I kept encountering it and going well okay maybe he means this and that's pretty good and so um it is funny though that a lot of a lot of his ideas probably because he had him as an inspiring uh, mentor along with Pierre Genet and all these other great minds that his many of his ideas have withstood the te test of time whereas some of particularly around the dream interpretation uh, com compared to like Freud's wish fulfillment and guardian of sleep and stuff like that it hasn't aged very well in this in the research but Jung's ideas have uh, stuck around um, so, so I mean the, the, the thing about you you both of you the kind of combo one-two punch here is that it is a step away from physicalism I mean Mark Soames work is kind of an essentially in a physicalist manifesto to me I mean he's talking about free energy and entropy being energy uh entropy reduction being the the cause of consciousness and it's just it, it just seems like we're back to matter in traditional yeah. neuropsychoanalysis which is so bizarre be because when his book the brain in the inner world which had a huge influence on me when I read it 
uh, that starts off out, right out the box with dual aspect monism. And I thought, yes, yes, that, that, that's really cool. You know, that makes more sense. And, and here, here we are. So. <laughs> um, is there anyone in particular that's studying which kind of archetypal images or metaphors are universal and which ones aren't like anger is heat? Mm. Well, the, where I got that from was research. Um, it was a, a, was a researcher in embodied cognition named Kovacek, which I'm pretty sure I'm butchering his name, but he's only interested in um, emotional metaphors in our language. And that, but when I was looking at that, I was thinking of, of Jung and the psyche and all that. Um, but no, not so much, not, not right now. And there needs to be, I think. And but I mean this this connection that I'm making is a relatively new one, and uh, I'm hoping that more people can you know grab onto it and, and explore it more. I'd love maybe, to see that. I'd love to see more yeah. more of that research. Maybe my next project. Hey, there you go. <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll talk. Email me. <laughs> There's Jonathan and then Ashley. Yeah, uh, go ahead, Jonathan. Oh, can't hear you. Jonathan, you need to unmute first. I'm sorry. You look like he is muted. Yeah, um, Jonathan, we're not. Yeah, you're unmuted, but um, we're not hearing you. Now? Oh, I can't hear you. Now we oh, can. there we go. Oh, sorry about that. I um yeah I love what you said about the psyche uses the body in this way and I'm just curious it seemed like your dis, your definition of archetypal images that and I could be wrong is that it, that it can be you can identify it cross culturally and I wonder if there's some tension with that in terms of you know sort of where John was coming from and even where you were talking about the spontaneity how do you reconcile the spot, you know, the spontaneous thought process, if that's sort of a deeper kind of cognition versus this idea of defining it in uh, sort of cross-culturally. Do you, do you, do you feel that tension or is, it, or how does that live with you? Um, so it's, maybe I'm wrong, but it sounds like what you're getting at is the question of the imagination and novel ideas and constructs maybe and well, like how do i square that with something universal well just that in the, the and this may be a split in jungian thought as well it's just that that there's on one hand there's a way to identify archetypal material as kind of cross-cultural universal but then there's this mm -hmm. other sort of emerging sort of relationship with it as this spontaneous something spontaneous and mm -hmm. and ineffable and and does that I feel like that creates this tension and in, in it within. Is there some way to reconcile those two ways of, of looking at it? Well, cause there's two yeah. different ways of, of relating with it, right? There's mm -hmm. one that's more sort of experiential and spontaneous, but then you could say, no, well, that's not universal, but yet it's mm -hmm. sort, of, sort of superseding my ego experience or whatever. Like I'm getting seized by it, but then I could dismiss it because I don't have a universal context for it i'm just mm -hmm. one mm -hmm. okay so maybe the, the the concern would be to to dismiss something as um if we identify it as non-archetypal does that necessarily follow that it's not important or not relevant maybe or something or like that it could be archetypal or even could be archetypal anyway right okay well it wouldn't be under the way i'm defining it um, <laughs> in which case we would need to redefine it if it didn't satisfy using mm. that criteria. I would, I would think, I would think. And what do we mean by archetypal in that sense? Leads us back to, you know, many, of course, many people have pondered that since the beginning is, does it mean that it's, um, if the, okay, if we're going to remove the universality of it, or the, at least the universal potential for it, 
then um, then should we use the term archetypal? I guess maybe it's a definition question. Mm, maybe, yeah. It's also kind of ret- it's the kind of thing that you can only really understand retrospectively, anyways. It's it's it's, but I feel like I'm just muddying the waters here. But I just wanted to, because I, I I struggle with that tension myself in in terms of you know understanding uh, the archetype because then maybe it's what, one way to look at this is remember that um, the spontaneously emergent um, images and expressions are going to be complex metaphors more often than not. They're going to be compositions. And I'm, I'm not saying that those are all universal. I'm saying that the primary metaphors that they are composed of are universal. Mm. So you can always have a new construction, brand new, out of the same inherited alphabet, you could construct your new word. It's still archetypal by my definition, mm. even though you may not have ever seen it anywhere. Mm. But it's uh, using all innate mappings to construct this new thing. Mm. Now, I think that the likelihood that you're going to run across a whole lot of those is probably low because there's billions of people on the earth and all that. But nevertheless, it's, it doesn't rule it out. So maybe that's the answer to the tension that you're talking about. Yeah, that's nice. Thank you. Made another question. Yeah, Ashley's up now. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm not sure if really this is a very philosophical question, or but um, I was just thinking of when you were speaking about um, the whole and the parts, um, sort of how an the manifestation of an archetype can um, take over and possess a collective group of people. So that when Jung talks about sort of Wotan and the archetype of Wotan being embodied by the German people before World War II, um, you know what I'm saying? Like how you could sort of explain that just as physicalism or, but I don't know. I mean, how you even go about understanding the neurobiology of a group of people and an archetype manifesting through a group and a group possession or mass possession rather than individual. Well, I've been talking mainly about the first part of a multi-part process, really. I've been just talking about how as the psyche will spontaneously create these expressions, um, some of them containing a preponderance of innate mappings, we'll call that an archetypal image, and as an expression of where I'm at in my given situation. Now, there's another way that this happens too, and that's I come across an archetypal image that really hits me hard, say a piece of religion or a piece of music even, and I just it just grabs a hold of me. It could still be composed primarily of innate mappings expressing something that really matches what I'm getting at, and it'll just grab a hold of me, <clears throat> and I'll get lost in it. It wouldn't necessarily have come from me, but because we, we are so promiscuous with our expressions and we, you know talk to each other so much there's two ways there's two processes that happened here too one is uh, an archetypal idea that is very resonant and c- captures imagination and emotion will spread rapidly but also as one progresses across multiple generations there's a filtering process particularly in oral cultures where you you grab onto the parts of a story um say or an image that hits you the hardest and you remember it. And so the rest of it gets forgotten. So you can have things like fairy tales that have so much emotion and uh, meaning in them. Well, the reason is because they've been filtered over many generations and they've been contributed to by multiple minds. <laughs> it's, I think, pretty rare that you have someone just spontaneously come up with a full blown archetypal narrative. There are a few examples of that um, that I can think of, but usually it's more this gradual process of uh, refinement over multiple generations and but even still you can have that wotan like uh, phenomenon that you're talking about where uh, someone would bring that out and of course now wotan as the germanic war god has all of that norse mythology wrapped up into it so it's already a highly resonant expression anyway because of that process that's another thing I talk about in one of my other papers is re- the whole idea of resonance. But um, so to use that, then it's sort of like using dynamite, right? I think Edinger said that we're using we're using 
explosives here. We may have to treat this stuff with care. <laughs> and this is why, because the imagery captures the emotion so powerfully in a way you cannot verbalize. And then it, you run away with it or it runs away with you. <laughs> Does that answer your question or not really? <laughs> Yeah, no, I don't even know exactly what the question is. It's just interesting to me to know That's how mass, mass psychology works and mass possession works with an archetype at certain times in a, a cultural history. Um, and because an like archetypal image, as particularly as I'm defining it, is going to be easily comprehensible and understandable by anybody anywhere. Mm -hmm. I think that's the power of it. If you, yeah. for example, if you use those cultural culturally specific metaphors you might not get what are they talking about grinding corn okay but everybody understands darkness and up and down and, and balance and, and all that kind of stuff immediately so if you combine it in a very artful and powerful way then you're setting fire to mm -hmm. you know, many many people yep, yep. Use thank another you metaphor <laughs> passion is fire very bad Hi, Eric. I just really wanted to thank you for your presentation. And it's such a beautiful compliment uh, with you and John, you know, coming from these different perspectives. Uh, uh, but, um, and I kept reflecting when John was talking and wondering in terms of your work too, just, you know, like the, the actual splitting of the cell, you know, the whole biological, physical aspect of it. But then I love how you worked in, you know, the mind body aspect and the correlation there. So thank you for that. And um, I just wanted to speak to the Kristen's, Kristen, right? Kristen's question of, and your statement about, you know, research about the archetypes. And um, I was looking at the IAAP site a couple of weeks ago, and I guess at the conference in South America lately, um, there was a presentation by a group that is uh, researching, collecting dreams of transgender and non-binary people to see what archetypal similarities there might be either emerging or just uh, across that. And I was just thinking uh, methodologically that might be the basis to apply, you know, to a broader, you know, to check out their methodology and see if there's mm -hmm. a way to apply it to a larger group or a different group as well, or in a complementary way, but that they're setting up some kind of methodology to do this. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I mean, the idea of using, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was just saying in terms of they're trying to capture archetypal images and, and images in general, you know, through the dream work of this specific subset of humanity. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I imagine that would be really, really interesting. Um, the idea of, of using masculine and feminine imagery to, to metaphorically depict other things, I think would definitely qualify as an innate mapping because everybody comes into the world with a pretty biologically oriented, um, way of recognizing those things. In other words, no one's going to be it completely alien to that imagery of saying such and such is as if it were a male or a, as if it were a female, you know, and that, and that applies probably to, to the various sexualities uh, on that spectrum, I would think. Well, look at the hermaphrodite and the syzygy that Jung talks about and how powerful that imagery is. It's, it's an eight. That's, that's what I say. <laughs> so that's why it's so powerful. It's easy to understand. Very powerful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I experienced that in my, uh, my own therapy when I was be just beginning, I encountered a hermaphroditic figure. And uh, I mean, I mean, immediately we were both me and my therapist were like, oh, well, okay, we, we know what that's all about. <laughs> it's about, you know, all of this various um, concepts being imaged as that and this uh, very alchemical. I didn't talk much about alchemy, but it's, it's loaded with innate symbolism. Yeah, that's, uh, yeah, the alchemy is so that's why it's so exciting for young when he um, kind of tripped over it, right? And found it, yeah. 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 Stopped, stopped him from all his other work, the Red Book and everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's use of rotation and heat and uh, spheres and all that stuff. That's all innate mappings right there. The balance, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, thank you for connecting that with what you were speaking about earlier about heat and up and down and that, thanks. Mm -hmm. Don, go ahead. Thanks. Um, just in terms of what we were just saying, um, uh, 
with the anima and animus and their contrasexual appearance in, um, in, well, in the other sex, quote unquote, that was changed to some degree um, in the 70s and 80s to an anim, because what about um, the homosexual person? What about a gay person? Are they going to have a contrasexual um, uh, counterpart that would be the anima or anima, animas? And so many people started talking about the anim just as a way of uh, a com compensating or, or changing because of cultural difference or awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, certainly. And in a homosexual individual, a, contra a contrasexual image is not going to carry the same emotional power mm -hmm. as the same sex would. And so I, I, and when I've worked with folks in therapy on this, with homosexuals, um, what would be labeled as the anima, say, in a homosexual man ends up being a male. And, but if you, you know that ahead of time, right, if you're aware of that, then, then it makes perfect sense because it's the, it's the desired physical object is being used to depict this deeper, less easily um, conceptualized experience. And once you go there, it makes sense. It's easier. And I think it's not even necessarily switching it, you know, into the, for the male, the animus, or et cetera, would be. And when we get mm -hmm. into transgenderism again, I think the idea of an anim, you know, again, might be more applicable because they're just other ways other than this sort of straight up binary contrasexual mm -hmm. way of looking at it. But the reason I bring it up is because it's something that has, I think, an example of something that has changed as social awareness has changed. Mm -hmm. um, and then how we experience and look at these archetypal representations. Yeah. So, thanks. Now, I believe the two speakers wanted to wrap up with a, a bit of a dialogue between themselves and we're approaching the, the end of our time. So uh, turn it over to Eric and John to uh, facilitate us going out the door. Thanks. Well, John, I, I said a lot about your work, and I, hopefully I didn't mess any of it up. <laughs> oh, not, not a bit. Um, I, I should say to the group that, you know, this has been one of my more enjoyable scholarly projects. Um, I, I, I think um, uh, both, both of us have, have really generated a lot of originality that uh, from our, our dialogues, and it started from from Eric had critiqued my um, my article on, on the essence on the essence of archetypes, and then I I got excited as someone's actually cr critiquing me and criticizing my thought, and then I responded to him with my own thought, and then he responded back to me, and that's how we cobbled this uh, book together, and it went from what is an archetype to then it went to what is the psyche and then er, where, where what we depart from is that Eric launches off into this grand metaphysics where I'm much more timid about it and I'd rather <laughs> stay within my little realm and he, he has this bold leap and um, <laughs> to go to the notion that the psyche emanates from a cosmic psychic process is um, uh, quite ambitious. And I do, I, I certainly think it resonates with anybody who's interested in, you know, in, in cosmology and in greater questions around uh, God, theology, um, the bigger metaphysical questions is something that we that we get into, and, and, and I think um, in detail we get into. And there's a, given that, you know, I'm a, got a philosophical background in psychology and Eric has a philosophical but scientific background as a psychiatrist, that we just came at things um, from all these different angles. And I think they are very compatible if you uh, are patient with, you know, I, I'm a very dense, dense writer. So uh, where Eric 
is much more friendly, uh, idea friendly you can grab onto as you could tell from the, from our talks. <laughs> um, the, one, the one thing that came out of, um, for myself was to have to think about, well, what is, what is psyche? And so I have a chapter in there on what I call psy world as a means of kind of mediating the, the, the notion of embodiment and experience. And uh, maybe it's similar to John's notion of essa and anima, uh, being and soul and the psychoid function. But I believe um, I have another book on my plate to finish around that uh, exploratory work. The one thing that um, I'm going to bracket and still remain bracketed, but let Eric uh, have a free for all with is the notion that the cosmos is, is conscious or that the cosmos is, um, has cognition and I, I have to, I have to maintain my my philosophical bracket there because it, it really raises a lot of questions, um, such as you know how could the universe ponder itself? Now, um, you know how does it have, how, how does it mirror the properties and experiences of the human being? Um, now, to his credit. He has an internally consistent logic that makes sense that you you um, you end up uh, solving the mirrorological problem uh, of the whole and the parts, um, but it still presupposes the whole. And this is a, a, a standard um, criticism of Neoplatonism, of um, you know, so Plotinus. Uh, as well as uh, Spinozian panpsychism. Um, at the same time, you have the celebrated monist, Hegel, Whitehead, who would fall into this, um, uh, you know, scheme uh, that, that I think Eric is, is fitting in. So, so I, I am very impressed and I hope that he continues to develop his own Jungian metaphysics. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm sure I will. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as far as the um, the pre presupposition uh, angle goes, as as you'll if you read the the book and the the argument that I defend there, it's um, it's not so much that I I really like having that in there. It's just that I realize that you have a presupposition no matter what metaphysics you come at, and that one at least has fewer problems than the other ones do. <laughs> and so unless you want to propose that there's some kind of infinitism going on, like there's never any sort of um, a prime mover or uncaused cause and all of that sort of stuff. And that we do know that we have consciousness because we experience it. And all of the myriad ways that we try to explain how it got there um, of all of those cosmopsychism to me anyway, poses the fewest so additional problems but of course that doesn't mean that there's not some other unthought of way of, of working it out that doesn't have that problem maybe some genius out there will come up with one but anyway there it is that's my story and i'm sticking to it <laughs> Yes, well, um, just a final thought. Um, you know, it's very difficult to say anything original. <laughs> I mean, uh, in, in today's world, I mean, everything has been done in the history of ideas, so to speak. And it's just, it's the nuances and the minutia of ideas that take us in different directions. And um, so I, it doesn't necessarily resolve the conundrums because we're still talking about these things now. If, if these were, if this would be considered uh, like just empirical facts, we would have not be debating these ideas. And I think that's what's interesting about human nature. And, and it goes back to the, the issue of um, 
well, maybe it goes back to uh, Plotinus, uh, the notion of the, the conundrum about the many and the one. I mean, how do we deal with the notion of, of the universality of the psyche that, that is, you know, applies to all people, regardless of who you are, time, gender, geographic location, culture, uh, so, and then also accounting for the notion of particularity and difference and multiplicity and pluralities. And I don't think the two um, are mutually exclusive. Um, I think we can get at these from different perspectives and, and maybe that is the solution to um, this uh, dual aspect monism that there are many different aspects of, of um, the way we are trying to make sense out of our lives and our world. Yeah, great, great points. Um, I had a, there was one, I just now noticed the chat here with some comments on here, archetypes based on the accumulation of human experience. Um, now we're in the process of creating new ones. Uh, absolutely new, I would say new compositions are possible all the time. I don't think there's going to be any new innate mappings anytime soon because they're based on very, very basic physiological principles. Like when I, when people get angry, their temperature, temperature goes up, it's simple stuff like that. But nevertheless, the new compositions of those absolutely are possible and, and likely, I think. And they're still archetypal under my definition anyway. Uh, but yeah, great questions. Uh, great comments. Appreciate you guys having us. Yeah, thank you very much.